Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our first Thursday Club for March. Um, shortly I'll be, be handing over to Helen Reese, who's going to be doing the presentation today. Um, but before I do that, uh, those of you that join us regularly will know there's a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, the first thing to say is that all your microphones will be muted throughout the presentation for, for obvious reasons. But that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. Um, we have a, a questions box um, as part of this functionality. So please just type your questions and pop them in the questions box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll host a short Q&A session. After the presentation, uh, we'll be sending out a small questionnaire. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you took the time to fill that in and, and gave us some feedback um, so we can sort of tweak what we're doing here. Okay, so today's talker is, is Helen Rees. Um, Helen has a PhD in environmental microbiology and she has worked on extremophiles, groundwater, TSEs, uh, and she did explain what that meant to me, but I can't pronounce it. So if you want to know, maybe she could tell you. Um, but has now been with ADAS for 13 years, where she is the business lead for the development and delivery of eDNA research and services. She was responsible for the development of the ADAS Great Crested Newt eDNA analysis service in 2014, which she project manages. Helen has further developed the ADAS eDNA business to include meta barcoding approaches for community analysis and other piece QPCR based methods for the detection of invasive and at risk species. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Helen. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, yeah, TSEs are uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. So, BSC in cattle, scrapie in sheep, don't work on them anymore. <laughs> so, yes, um, I'm Helen Rees. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm director of the ADAS biotechnology business. I'll just turn my camera off. Um, so, ADAS is um, the UK's largest independent provider of um, agricultural and environmental consultancy policy advice and research and development. Um, we're a company of about 400 staff and we're part of the RSK group of companies um, just like RSK Biosensis. So, um, we work in a wide range of areas including um, soils, waters, agriculture, climate change and research and development, uh, which is where I'm based. Uh, ADAS is uh, celebrating their 75th birthday this year, so um, there's, um, I've just I've written the web address of a, a little video, a YouTube video, um, that tells you a bit more about what ADAS does, or you can um, search for ADAS 75 if you're interested in finding out a bit more about uh, ADAS. So, as I said, I, I work in the biotechnology business. There's a group of six staff, and up until recently, we were based out of the University of Nottingham in the vet school, where we uh, collaborated with several of the academics there. Uh, but last year we moved into some purpose-built um, laboratories, a suite of laboratories that we had built um, and we're now based out of Beeston in, in South Nottingham. So we have two distinct strands of work. Um, we do research into novel immunodiagnostic, immunodiagnostics and therapeutics, which I'm not going to talk about today, and um, molecular diagnostic services, which is where our eDNA work fits in. So just have a, a little, oops, click on the right thing have a little um, slide showing what we're going to cover today. So um, firstly, what is environmental DNA, eDNA? How does eDNA analysis work? A couple of examples of eDNA analysis, and then I'm going to introduce DNA barcoding, metabarcoding, uh, some pros and cons of eDNA analysis methods, and um, give a short summary. So to start, what is eDNA? So eDNA is the genetic material found in any environment, so it could be a pond, a woodland, a river, ocean, or even the air. And the genetic material includes microbes that live there, as well as any DNA shed into the water by larger organisms. And roots um, of shedding can include skin cells, faeces, saliva, and urine. Um, so environmental samples, such as this pond water sample here, um, will contain a unique mix of genetic material. Um, the presence of eDNA is um, short-lived, so eDNA usually persists in the environment um, for periods ranging from a few days to a couple of weeks uh, before it's broken down by the action of enzymes, UV radiation and microbial action. So that ultimately results in a loss of detectability. So this means that when we do detect DNA from a particular species, um, it's likely to represent the presence or a very recent presence in your sample. So how does eDNA analysis work? 
uh, eDNA analysis is it's based on the detection of a species specific fragment of DNA, which is generally mitochondrial DNA. So this image um, shows um, a typical animal cell um, and its components. So here we've got nucleus and mitochondria, and both of these components contain genetic material. So the DNA in mitochondria is far more abundant than, than the DNA in nuclear DNA. So you get perhaps hundreds of copies in the cell compared with um, one or two for nuclear DNA. And that means that you've got a far greater chance of detecting it in environmental samples. And another important point about mitochondrial DNA is um, the DNA sequences show a lot more diversity between closely related organisms. So that makes it easier for us to assign DNA that we find to individual species. So this is um, mitochondrial, mitochondrial genome here. And it's just to say that um, different eDNA assays uh, will look for different genes um, from the mitochondrial, mitochondrial genome. Um, most often um, cytochrome oxidase 1 is used, but often we see cytochrome B and other components um, of the mitochondrial genome being used. <clears throat> so in order to detect um, DNA, we need to employ molecular techniques such as polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So PCR is a cornerstone technique in modern molecular biology and it, it generates millions of copies of a specific sequence of DNA. So if, if you think of an analogy for this, it's like finding a needle in a haystack and making a haystack out of the needles. Now we all know about the, the COVID PCR tests that we've been seeing for the last couple of years. This detects um, small amounts of COVID virus genetic material. And the difference here in eDNA analysis is the PCRs that we're employing are instead um, uh, identifying, detecting very small amounts of vertebrate or invertebrate or bacterial DNA from a species of interest. So eDNA analysis can be broken down into three steps. Uh, firstly, you have your sample collection. And the question you need to ask yourself is, what environment do I want to sample? So this could be collecting a water sample from a pond or a river and putting into um, an ethanol preservative. It could be um, collecting samples from vein traps or these are beetles collected from um, pitfall traps. It could be collecting a soil core or it could be filtering water and preserving the DNA on the filter. And the second step after you've taken your samples back to the laboratory is your DNA extraction. So this might involve spinning your samples in a centrifuge at high speed centrifugation and it's followed by um, using a kit <clears throat> which extracts DNA from the sample and it also purifies and concentrates the DNA into a much smaller volume. Or you might directly extract DNA from one of your specimens or you might directly extract DNA off a filter again using a kit. The third step is the analysis step. <clears throat> and I'm talking about um, qPCR here, which is um, a real-time PCR. So here we've got one of our real-time PCR machines connected to a laptop, which you probably can't see the trace on it. But here at the side, this is um, a result of a great crested newt um, test. And um, you see a sigmoidal curve, if I can illustrate that with the arrow. So if you see a sigmoidal curve, what that means is you've got amplification of your PCR, and that means that the sample's positive for the species you're interested in. Or you might get a flat line on your graph um, where there's no amplification, <clears throat> meaning that the sample's negative for your species of interest. So it's a nice, quick, visual yes, no answer. So the best known example of using um, eDNA analysis in ecology is that of the Great Crested Newts in the UK. Um, and this is how we at ADAS first got involved um, starting working with eDNA. So in 2012, one of our ecologist colleagues asked the question, can you test a water sample to see if it has Great Crested Newts in it? And he was actually um, referring at this time to the use of a lateral flow test where we could dip a lateral flow test into a pond water and see if you could detect great crested newts. Um, because they're going out and performing GCN surveys using traditional methods um, during the survey season for their clients, and they wanted to know if there would be another way to do it. So over the next, we went, we went away and thought about it and looked at um, publications. And luckily around this time, um, the Thompson Group published a paper um, 
which um, contained an assay for great crested newts. So we spent the next couple of years um, getting our ecologist colleagues to collect water samples when they were going out to perform um, GCN surveys. Um, and we got the assay up and running in the lab and compared a whole load of samples with, with known great crested newt presence and absence. And we published this work in 2014, just after um, DEFRA published a much larger study in the UK um, of the use of this eDNA um, assay to detect great crested newts in the UK. <clears throat> so this was um, very quickly followed by Natural England sanctioning um, the eDNA assay for great crested newts from April 2014. And because we'd already been working on eDNA, we were in a really good place and we started offering um, Great Crested Newt uh, eDNA testing service. And since 2014, we've analysed nearly 19,000 samples. But um, so hundreds of papers have been published on eDNA methods for all sorts of species from a range of environments, although the majority are still in water. But as long as you can get a reference or control material and sequence data is available, Single species detection is essentially limitless. Um, eDNA analysis has been used for the detection of a range of species worldwide now, and that includes both rare and invasive species, and also over a range of genera, such as fish or amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and invertebrates, such as mollusks and gastropods. <clears throat> so we, in the last 18 months at ADAS, have been involved in, involved in developing um, an eDNA assay for some freshwater snail species for Natural England. Um, and that included the Chinese mystery snail, which is um, an invasive species in this country. It was discovered at the Pevensey levels in East Sussex in 2018. The hypothesis being that it was either accidentally or intentionally released by an aquarist. It's also known to be an Asian delicacy, so there is a, a hypothesis that perhaps it was released for this purpose. Um, so we developed an eDNA, eDNA assay to work in conjunction with manual surveys to monitor the spread of the species through the ditch system at the site. Um, and this will allow mitigation measures um, to be to put in place so that we can prevent the further spread of the species. We've also been involved in um, developing an eDNA assay for another snail species, um, Segmentina nitida. This is um, a UK Biodiversity Action Plan priority species, um, the shining ram's horn snail. And this um, is, was carried out at the Stodmarsh Natural, National Nature Reserve. So this species is um, susceptible to overmanagement of ditches. And we developed the eDNA assay to help determine its presence in the ditches to inform um, management decisions. So, you know, we're happy to work with, with clients to meet their needs and, and answer their specific um, ecological questions um, by either developing new eDNA assays for them or applying existing assays um, for a variety of species. Now, so far we've looked at single species detection, but what do you do if the question is what's in my sample rather than is species X, Y or Z in my sample? And in order to do this, I need to introduce the principle of DNA barcoding. <clears throat> so DNA barcoding it, it involves um, starting by extracting DNA, as you would for um, great crested newt eDNA analysis, for example. Um, and um, you then PCR up um, a specific part of the mitochondrial DNA called cytochrome oxidase 1. You purify your uh, PCR product send it off for sequencing, and when you get your sequence returned, you compare this to online sequence databases, and that allows you to come up with a species identification. Now, the best way to think about this is as if the DNA sequence of, you know, about 680 base pairs is a supermarket barcode. So every species has a different barcode, just as every item in a supermarket will have a different barcode. And that allows us to identify each species. So we use this technique um, when we identify bat species from, um, from guano. So we've got some um, guano, some droppings here. We use a kit to extract the DNA. We PCR amplify, um, send it off for sequencing. And when we get our sequences back, we search against the databases. And here you can see this sequence has got a 99% identity to um, a sequence um, of a bat on, on the databases. So, um, <clears throat> this allows us to identify the species that the faeces came from, 
and it's not limited to bat species identification it can be used on um, many other species can be identified in this way <clears throat> so meta barcoding uses the same principle as dna barcoding but it allows the parallel sequencing of thousands or millions of um, pieces of dna at the same time so this is going to allow us to answer the question of what is in my sample rather than is species x y or z in my sample so the process starts in the same way by extracting dna from a sample for example a water sample and this will contain the dna from the whole community of species present we then PCR amplify the region of DNA that we're interested in using a PCR that's not specific to a single species. So um, we, we are essentially accounting for variations in sequence across a multitude of species. So in the diagram here, we've got a mixed sample with lots of different um, genomic DNA in it. And this allows us to amplify lots of different species represented by the different colors as opposed to um, a single species. Now there have been primers designed for the amplification of whole groups of vertebrates and invertebrates and plants and um, we can apply these to a different you know a range of samples um, for metabarcoding. So the resulting products um, are then sequenced on a high throughput sequencing platform which generates millions of sequences and these are then processed using bioinformatics, which is essentially just computer data analysis. And that ends with the comparison of the sequences that we've generated with online sequence databases. And that produces a list of species that are present in the original sample. Now, it's important to note that um, the results will only ever be as good as the databases that we're comparing our sequences to. So if a species DNA is not present in the database, um, you will not be able to identify that species in your sample. So these are known as gaps in the databases, barcode gaps, and a lot of work has been carried out worldwide on closing these gaps, uh, including in, in the UK, the um, Darwin's Tree of Life project being run by the Sanger Institute, um, which plans to read the genomes of all known species of animals, plants, fungi, and protocysts in Britain and Ireland. So it's a, a very ambitious, very ambitious um, project and you can look at their website if you want to find out more information about that. So um, at ADAS we've been involved in a number of metabarcoding projects uh, ranging from gene pools which is one that we're uh, carrying out at the moment. This is investigating the life that dwells in garden ponds in uh, Bristol, London and Newcastle. This is for Natural England and it's being carried out alongside CFAS and the Natural History Museum and the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. Um, we also have a PhD student who's looking at zooplankton and phytoplankton metabarcoding uh, and we've done um, terrestrial invertebrate metabarcoding from um, pitfall and vein trap samples. So um, the results can be presented in a variety of ways um, and I've just put an example of uh, a graph, which is a nice visual representation of how results might look. Um, and on these, each, um, each color, if I can get my arrow, each color represents a different species. And the size of the color represents the proportion of sequence reads for that species. So you can see here in sample, oh, it's gone. you can here see, see in sample one, for example, the species represented in green is higher in a much, larger proportion than it is in sample two, for example. And likewise, in sample two, the species represented in yellow is present in a much higher proportion than it is in um, sample one. So it's a nice visual representation of your results. Um, if we look at um, the literature, since 2011, over a thousand peer-reviewed papers have been published using metabarcoding. And there's a huge variety of um, applications. So it might be biodiversity of soils, it could be fungal species diversity, it could be blood meals of mosquitoes, and that's really interesting because you can perform diet analysis and, and create food webs. It's also been used um, uh, on pollen to work out what um, plants honeybees are feeding on, is that for example? Uh, it's been used for benthic communities, and, and there's many more examples um, where metabarcoding has been used. So it really is a powerful technique. Um, that's becoming ever more popular. But there are pros and cons to environmental DNA analysis. <clears throat> so certainly the ease of taking samples using um, simple and low cost equipment um, lends itself 
uh, very nicely to to be able you know to performing this kind of analysis. Um, eDNA analysis, e analysis is also generally non-invasive, so that offers considerable advantages over traditional techniques where the species might need to be um, disturbed or caught to get a positive identification, and obviously that encroaches on animal welfare. Um, eDNA is particularly useful for species that are difficult to detect or elusive um, using conventional methods or even where licenses are required. So um, it really does lend itself to projects that involve local communities um, of citizen scientists, and that in turn can help increase public awareness and understanding of um, science and the environment and reduce the costs associated with the survey effort. Um, EDA analysis in the last decade has really proved to be a robust technique um, that can increase detection rates, it can reduce survey effort and save costs compared to conventional surveys. But this is all provided that the best practice and quality control procedures are put in place and, and robustly followed. So this is, is both in terms of sample collection and laboratory analysis. Um, errors are possible if care is not taken during sample collection. So for instance, cross-contamination of samples or sampling equipment might cause false positive detection during laboratory analysis. And um, similarly, poor laboratory technique and cross-contamination within the laboratory um, and that could be during sample processing or even from prior amplified PCR products that can lead to um, false positive results. So we really need to ensure that most the most robust laboratory setup and you know to minimize in laboratory cross contamination, eDNA laboratories should really run in a unidirectional flow, and that that means by a one way system. So materials and staff don't move between different laboratories. Um, so if you have a DNA extraction laboratory, a PCR setup laboratory, and a PCR amplification laboratory, you're not moving between um, these, these different laboratories. <clears throat> so for um, eDNA analysis of great crested newts in the UK, um, Natural England via FAPAS provides a proficiency testing scheme. So this is whereby laboratories are um, assessed annually for their accuracy, accuracy, consistency and false errors. And ADAS is the only service provider that scored 100% in every year that this proficiency test has been run between 2017 and 2022. So, you know, we're really proud of that. Um, and finally, as yet, um, eDNA is not able to provide quantitative data to the level of accuracy really needed to determine how many individuals might be present. At best, it's, it's a semi-quantitative method. So just to just to summarise, um, eDNA can be used to detect almost any species where a sample can be collected. It has advantages over traditional techniques, but it's not a replacement for those. It's not yet quantitative. Um, <clears throat> it's becoming an important tool in the study of aquatic and terrestrial biodiversity, and it, it really has the potential to reduce costs and turnaround times and also improve our ability to survey taxa that are otherwise difficult to find or identify. And, and finally, just to say, you know, we work with a, a variety of clients to develop eDNA assays for their sites and answer their specific questions. So um, if you have any questions that, that don't get answered during the Q&A session, please, you know, these are my contact details, please do get in touch. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Uh, fascinating talk. And uh, I know, for one, I've been thinking of all the other things we could we could use this for. I was trying to work out a way we could use it for birds, um, but I guess other other options are probably more readily available for, for birds. Um, there's been quite a few questions um, come in, um, but we would welcome more. Um, the ones we don't get around to answering today, then um, we'll Helen will get back to you. We'll, we'll get a list yeah. of them sent to Helen, and she can she email you directly. Um, Okay, well, let's uh, kick off with how can an ecologist have confidence that the results of an eDNA assay are correct? Right, so this um, this really points towards, um, well, this is what the purpose of the proficiency testing is, for example, for, for great crested newts. Um, but it's not just proficiency testing, you need to be assured that your laboratory of choice is um, performing to best practice guidelines and has good quality quality control systems in place. Um, and also it's, it's very important to ensure that any assays that you're interested in have been well validated. So I um, and an author on a, a paper that was published last year um, where we developed a validation scale for eDNA assays um, 
the purpose was to determine the readiness of, of available eDNA assays for routine species monitoring. And you know, some of them are, are ready. So Great Crested Newts is a brilliant example that's you know used and it's very well validated. Others are, are less well validated. And um, I think it's really important, you know, if you want to try something new, a new assay, you need to ask how well validated it is and um and, and be aware that for some assays more validation will be necessary. And then and then you really I think can you can then trust your 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 results if your if your lab's doing that and you you know your assay is a good well validated test. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you kind of have your work cut out, I think, Alan. There's a lot of questions coming in, which is great, <laughs> by the way, everybody. Keep them coming. Um, okay, uh, this one here. What are the prospects for using eDNA approaches in a quantitative way in the future, using line reads, for example? Um, it's, it's the thing that everybody wants to get working. So, you know, it, it would be brilliant if it did. There have been some studies where they have managed to find slight correlations between um, a biomass, for example, and rather than, a, well, some for abundance. Um, we're not there yet by any means. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more research in that area carried out, carried out over the next few years. So. There was another one here, actually, that was similar. Can you use eDNA to assess population size, which I guess is is, this, is a similar thing. It's a similar thing, yeah. We're, we're just not quite there yet. I mean, the with the great crested newts, the, the DEF report did try to look at that, and there was a very there was a small correlation, um, but um, it just wasn't good enough, I don't think. Um, yeah, quite a few confusing variables, presumably as well, in the environment. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose another sim similarly linked question was, can you use eDNA to survey for species in running water? And presumably yes, the yes. challenge is involved in that compared to static water, is there? Yes, yeah, there is. I mean, but there have there's been a lot of um, assays developed for species um, in rivers, in in marine environments, and obviously um, flow of a transport of eDNA is is a, an important factor. But um, uh, yeah, it's often counteracted by you know sample volumes and um, number of samples you take. But yeah, it's, it is possible in running water. So there there is a lot of work being done in that as well. Okay, and I suppose it's linked to the, the time thing here. Is it what is the time sensitivity or temperature sensitivity of samples? How sensitive are they, and how quickly do they need to go from the field to the lab? Um, so, if if this is in terms of great crested newt samples, for example, so they are the whole point of the water being put into the um, ethanol preservative is that the ethanol is there to preserve your DNA. So, um, as long as you're not um, having those samples at high temperatures, your DNA should be preserved until it gets back to the lab. Likewise with filters, um, when labs send out filters to people, they'll often have a preservative, it might be ethanol, it might be um, a buffer preservative, and the whole point of that is to preserve the DNA. I mean, it is always best to try and keep the samples cool or in a fridge if you can, but you know, or, uh, you, you want to get samples back to the lab quickly, but you know, there's a reason why we're adding preservatives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how does the water depth of the taken samples affect the results? Do you get different results sampling <clears throat> the surface and the bottom? Yeah, so actually we, and myself and a colleague were talking about this yesterday because we, we were saying, <laughs> you know, if you have a pond that's six metres deep and a pond that's, you know, 30 centimetres deep, then presumably that's going to affect, you know, the amount of eDNA that you can recover. And obviously that will. Um, there have been studies um, done, there's a great study actually done um, of fish in um, the Lake District and some of the lakes in the Lake District by um, a group in Hull University um, and they looked at transects across um, across the lakes, they looked at depths, they looked at um, around around the lake so you can um, you can do all these different things and if you sample in lots of different areas and different depths and obviously you're going to get better, better rep representative results. Um, but certainly for ponds, it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue with with the depth, um, as long as your pond's not going too big. <laughs> sure. uh, okay, one more. Can you use eDNA to detect pathogens such as chytrid? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. There's there's a, one. There is, yeah, there is a test for chytrid um, from water samples. Yeah. Also, um, crayfish plague. Uh, I think ranavirus as well. 
uh, this is a bit more esoteric, I suppose, but uh, where do you see the DNA testing industry going in the next couple of years? Uh, right. Well, for, for ADAS specifically, you know, we're, obviously we're going to carry on with our Great Crested Newt service and 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 you know provide other assays for other species as our as our clients want. But I do think that we'll move more and more towards the metabarcoding because it is becoming more popular as clients um, start to realise the potential that it's got. Um, one thing that we're particularly interested in at the moment, actually, it's interesting you mentioning the birds, Tim, is um, last year, at the end of last year, there were a couple of papers published where they looked at eDNA in air samples, and they essentially um, collected air samples from in and around zoos, and they were able to detect a lot of the species present in the zoos within these air samples. So we are, we, and, well, ourselves and lots of other people are, are really interested in looking at that, I and mean, we've done some air sampling previously, so we want to try some of the methods we'd used before and see if we can detect eDNA in those samples. So that's, I think that's a really exciting, really interesting area of research. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, can we get eDNA from extreme or harsh environments? Um, yeah, I'm guessing sort of deserts and, and, and those sort of areas. Yeah, yes, I mean, yeah, you can. I mean, so uh, when I, my PhD was um, on extremophiles from high high salt high alkalinity environments so i was looking at um uh, bacteria and archaea from um, soda lakes in kenya um, and you know we were able to detect we were able to look at community analysis for those um for those samples so yes it's entirely possible i mean obviously if you're in a very hot environment it's all about sample preservation so that, that would need to be carefully considered i think mm. but yeah that's, i see no reason why not uh could eDNA be used to assess total number of species in a sample, even with the gaps in the reference library? Uh, yes, in the sense that, so when you're doing metabarcoding, you get your list of species that are known to be present, and um, you can, any sequences that don't match things on the database, you can you group them together and have a representative sequence for those. Um, so they're called OTUs or, or AVIs. And although they're not assigned to a species, you might be able to assign them to a, a genus, for example, or you can then search at a later date to see if, if gaps have been filled in the databases and, and, and see if you can detect them that way. So yeah, I guess it gives you a proxy for yeah. diversity without knowing the full species yes, list. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So all the ones we do know, plus there's 10 we don't, but we know there's 10. Yes. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, this is a bit of a left field one. Um, can eDNA be used for archaeological purposes? Archaeological? Yeah. Oh, in what sense? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. you're sort of entering the realms of ancient DNA analysis. So the, the, there is a whole field of ancient DNA analysis, um, and certainly labs that do that have even sort of higher levels of um, protection in the lab people have to you know it's all um it's, it's very it's, it's tricky stuff to do that but yeah uh, you can you can apply it to certainly to ancient samples so yeah okay i'm gonna probably draw it to a close there's just maybe perhaps time for two more um this one is why is isn't it a replacement for some techniques for example why would you still need traditional survey techniques for great crested newts so for great crested newts specifically, um, the reason you still need the the traditional surveys is because you need population counts. So if you have a positive sample, Natural England wants to know whether it's high, medium, low population, and at the moment you can't you can't get that from from your eDNA results. And in in, in other areas, so for example the snails, um, you know eDNA was was going to be used to to give an idea of where where the snail species might be present and certainly with the invasive snails with the chinese mystery snails you, you know you really need to confirm whether it is there or not um so you you, you do get uses of the, of the you know using eDNA and traditional methods in conjunction and i think certainly for metabarcoding it's, it's going to be that way you know for certainly a long time to come because we need taxonomic expertise um to be able to to help us fill these barcode gaps for example so um yeah we still need to use both sure yeah 
okay a final question and this by far isn't the, the last one on the list by the way um, but we're sort of running out of time but um, are you involved in any research into eDNA survey of water courses for terrestrial mammals such as water voles? Uh, not personally it is something we're interested in I know that um, there is a test that has been developed for water voles but it's not been published um, there are tests where uh, people have looked for mammals and certainly when you do metabarcoding you might be looking for fish species but often you will pick up other species as well and that might be mammals or birds or you know so yes there's work has been done so you can detect mammals as well yeah especially if you're using water body for drinking you can detect you can detect mammals mm -hmm. okay that's fantastic thanks once again helen um and thanks everybody for your attendance today. We had really good numbers, and like I said, uh, lots of really interesting questions, of which we've we've delved into some of them. Um, the rest of you will get a, a response from Helen, like I said. Um, also, we will send out that post sort of webinar questionnaire. So it'd be great if you could take the time to fill that in. Um, the last thing for me to do is to, to mention the the one next month, uh, which will be on the seventh of April, the first Thursday Club, and it's with uh, Dr. Pete Walker from RSK Biosensus. And as always with Pete, he's talking about eels. No, he's not. God, he's not talking about eels. What he might do, because it says in here, what's what in the wet, why and when you might need an aquatic ecologist. And those of you who know Pete will know that he will have a photo of an eel and mention them. So we look forward to seeing you all then. But so apart from that, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Helen, and we'll see you then. Okay.